Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks for giving up your time today to join us for this webinar entitled Data Driven Athlete Recovery. And that will be presented by uh, Richard Hunnix, who is Head of Human Performance at the Rugby Football League. My name is Derek Houghton from Click IT, and we're specialists in data analytics, and we've been delighted to have worked with and supported Richard in the development of this solution. So anyway, we're going to get straight into the presentation. But if you have any questions that arise during the presentation, please use the chat facility at the bottom of the meeting control panel. Just type in the question, press return or enter on your keyboard, and we'll pick those up as we uh, we'll go during the presentation. And I'll endeavor to uh, fire them at Richard at the end of the presentation, time permitting. OK, so Richard, it's over to you. Thank you, Derek. Good afternoon, everyone. Just a quick uh, technology. Um, ask for everybody, if you're struggling for any audio reason to hear me, if you just fire a statement over to us, uh, Derek will pick that up and then we'll, we'll look at that and make sure that you've all got perfect audio for the presentation this afternoon. Um, I'm lucky to be able to present this uh, format for really the second time and I've made some slight manipulations to it. Uh, the reason I'm doing this today was um, I presented this in London at an analytics conference and it, it seemed to be very well received, so hence the follow-up. Um, the purpose of today really is to give everyone out there an insight into the data that is collected within a professional rugby league team at the highest level, that is with England, um, what it actually is, why we actually collect it, and then what we do with it in terms of player management and also the platforms that we use to uh, analyze and display the data that we're collecting um, and hopefully tell a little bit of a story about the journey that we're currently on as a sport um, and you know where we see it leading uh, and then all being well there's some take-homes for everybody whichever angle you're approaching today from so uh, one of the issues that I think everybody will come across whether you're working in sports science analytics uh, strength and conditioning or, or or out of professional sport and other areas is the amount of data that is, is now currently available and, and we live in a, a data age where it seems to be the, the absolute um, bee's knees to have more data than the next team or more data than the next person but my personal view is um, that it, it's what you do with it that counts and uh, applying the information that you've got to the environment you're in so hopefully um, that comes across today and uh, we can take it on from there. So uh, The sport and putting the sport into context for everybody. Uh, rugby league, if you don't know the game, it's a 13 a side, uh, high impact, high collision, high running, running based team sport, uh, quite simply put. The context of the environment that I work in and delivered in for the, the data that we're going to talk about today was actually a test match series. So we're talking about four games, one of which was a friendly, um, and then three test matches against, on paper, the best team in the world, which was New Zealand at this point in time. So, um, four-match series, in summary, we had a five-week camp, 13 field training sessions within that time, nine weight sessions to accommodate, 20 wellness blocks, 23 recovery sessions. We worked over multiple locations. There was a number of travel um, issues involved in working on multiple locations and then all of the other in commitments that players at professional level have including media etc etc. Why have I just given you that information? Well a lot of people ask me what actually do you collect and what data do you do you get from a sports team? Uh, some of you will know quite quite clearly out there well there is match related data so intensity and um, load locomotive mode car, local locomotive mode load, beg your pardon, cardiovascular load, training load, uh, training volume and intensity based from GPS collection, weight training or resistance strength training load in terms of the uh, capacity that and strength capacity of the players that you're working with, wellness collection to, uh, and that can be on a number of levels, I'll drill down into that today, recovery sessions, so how the body biochemically is uh, reacting to the work and the stress that it's put on the so uh, immediately within 32 seconds of explaining some of the elements that we work with, you're starting to get an idea of how much data there is. 
The game itself, uh, and you'll see the word high in there frequently, is high intensity bursts. It's aerobically very demanding for the players. It leads to significant muscle damage, um, and there, there are psychological demands which fall into that as well. Why do I highlight those issues and, and those demands? And in a five-week tournament, that all comes around to recovery and how you manage the players, as you can see on the picture there, the 23 players that are available to play in every test match. If you haven't got players available at the start line in professional sport, you're never going to win the game. So you need your best players fit. And all of the work we're doing really within this context is about recovery and preparation to play at the highest level. So England's Rugby League, England Rugby League's philosophy is really twofold. And this is driven by uh, was driven by the head coach when the initi initiative started and is driven by the staff as a core now across the program. We need primarily to know what the player's readiness to play state is. So that's a number of subcategories. It, it contributes to athlete management, making players comfortable in an uncomfortable environment. Injury risk reduction, not prevention. Uh, you've got to be very cautious in the sports world to say, you're preventing injuries, well, how do you know? The actual statement is you're trying to reduce the risk of injuries, in my opinion. And we're also looking to lead in player provision. So and that all contributes to that readiness to play um, factor, which we're going to talk heavily about today. We then just take that into the phrase of need to know and nice to know. In the England Rugby League philosophy, we're really talking about what we need to know. There is a lot of nice to knows in data, in the information that we collect, but what do we need to know what's going to make an impact? So we need to know the wellness state, we need to collect the subjective and objective data related to that, we need to interpret it effectively, and we need to make it work in the environment we are in. What I wouldn't suggest you take from today is this exact model and try and apply it to your environment, and I'm sure that's common sense to everyone who's listening. Uh, the model has to be bespoke for the environment. And this is what worked for us at this time on our journey, and it is ever-evolving. So detailing down a little bit, um, there's two real strands of today. Um, what the demands of the game are and what we did to manage those demands, and then also the data in terms of how it's displayed and analysed. And we've got there in front of you now quite a... Um, elaborate Excel dashboard which has been formed by some of our team to demonstrate the demands of the game. In my opinion, it is quite noisy as a data display platform, although you can, uh, as you, you will all know, click in and out and find various components based on the slicer there on the side, etc. We're looking there at the movement variables, collisions, cardiometric results, there is a lot of information there. So just bear that in mind as we progress through the game, through the session. What we've got here is three test matches. So we're talking about the three key test matches against the best team in the world at the time, New Zealand. We've got match day one, match day two, and match day three. Uh, occasionally, I apologize, I refer to test matches, so T1 versus T3, for example. Uh, and please also understand that this is retrospective so it's easy for me now to make draw conclusions bear also in mind that as this program was developing and we we're gathering the data didn't actually have the luxury of this information as we, we began the process so the demands of the game show quite clearly here that test match one two and three differ significantly really in terms of demands apart from collision as you can see highlighted there as it goes up through the three games and then also the locomotive increases this is an average, a mean figure of the, the 13, or the 17 really, which if you understand the ins and outs of rugby, the interchanges are 10 per game international level, which allows you to manipulate the use of players quite efficiently throughout the 80 minutes. Hence, actually, the range on these figures is quite significant, where you have fullbacks running around 10k per game, 8 to 10k. Uh, and then maybe the front rowers, the high impact we'd call them, the front rowers and the collision-based players actually running 
a lot nearer the one to three thousand kilometers depending on minutes played so we've got a broad brush stroke there of the demand but um, albeit there's a lot of information there's still a lot more to look at in terms of that the trend you can see though is the increase from test one to test three we also got as a final point on there a significant increase in cardiovascular load so the matches were getting more demanding from a cardiovascular point of view as we went through the three match series played over three weeks just breaking the each of those metrics down. These metrics have come from uh, Statsport's GPS system uh, and as you may well know with GPS technology there is a multitude, there are a multitude of metrics available. Uh, I've worked with the GPS systems now for around eight years and I firmly believe that you can very quickly get lost with all of the possible opportunities there are to analyze player performance or player workload through the system. My personal view is to keep it very, very simple and to look at metrics that work for your group. So I've talk, I'm going to talk about three really here just to give you a little bit more insight between match three, two and one or one, two and three depending on how you're looking at it. So you can see there the trend with distance which just reaffirms um, what we're talking about with the locomotive demands. Very simplistic in terms of its demonstration, but it gives a coach a real overview of what's been happening within the matches through the series there and distance. Take it into high speed running, um, and you've got a little bit of a change there. Match day two, where you're seeing a peak on high speed running. High speed running being above 80% of the maximum is our terminology. So it is um, pretty quick for these guys. You're talking between seven to nine and a half meters per second really depending on the maximum velocity. Each of the guys are profiled individually and again just worth highlighting here that it, we've got broad brush strokes. It would be on the remit of a 45 minute webinar to take you into each player specifically. It is something that we'll talk about as we go later on through the presentation. Collisions and I talked about collisions in the opening gambit about the intensity of the game. Collision plays a massive part in rugby league and the associated soreness and muscle damage from, from that and also in rugby union to, to, to an extent as well. You can see here a clear spike on match day two, on test match two, which is quite interesting in itself that that's where, where you see the most collisions and how does that tie into the locomotive metrics that we see? and also the cardiovascular stress. And these are questions that I try to ask myself as I look at the data. Do I have all the answers? No, not yet, but it's, um, it's worth bearing in mind as we develop through the session. Take away you now your mindset from match demands and actually think about demands of training. From a coaching point of view, from a head coach's point of view, the coaches always ask, how hard can we train? I want to do this, I would like to do that, um, and as a sports science department or a performance department, it's really our role to give best advice um, and then allow the coach to make judgment from that point. What these tools, the GPS specifically, probably shouldn't do is dictate absolute practice. I don't think you can take away from your, your coaching instinct, understanding your athletes, knowing the environment you're in, and applying all of those elements when you make a decision. So please don't walk away from today or write in your notes as I'm speaking, this guy makes every decision off his data. That's categorically not, not the case. But what it does do is tell us what we have done. So again, this is retrospective, but we had a predictive model. And I'm pleased to say in relation to training, the model that was prescribed due to the coach's understanding and adherence to and trust with the advice that he was given was actually replicated in the actual and we can I'm just going to talk through a few key areas here so we've got training day three two of one just to break that down for you three being a lot of people use the terminology match day minus one minus two minus three um, for us match day minus three was the first training day of the week usually five days prior to the game then match day two would be the following day, so training day two the following day, and then minus one, as we've got on here, would actually be the day before the game. So some clear things to look at. 
we were hoping for and achieved, and I will explain why, really a front-loading effect in terms of our training um, load from intensity and a volume point of view, and go into that a little bit more in a second. A lot of that was based off player wellness, player well-being status, which we're going to talk about as we move through. Effectively, two days after a game, match day minus three, the further stay away from the game, the players should be suffering or will be suffering from some level of soreness, and we'll see that further on. But we can afford to actually load the players with a relatively high volume, but relatively low intensity would be the, the guide from our point of view for a performance department. How the coach um, actually delivers the training session, the content of the drills, the types of drills that you work with will often dictate how much load is put through the players, how intense it is, both from a locomotive and a cardiovascular perspective. So we were trying to load early in the week with a view to tapering later in the week. So our volume really was done in training day one, um, training day three and two were training day one before the game being the most, being the least, um, least loaded. We actually looked at a planned increase in intensity on the second day, so that middle day of training with a decrease in volume, which we saw displayed here. If I'm honest, was it quite as pronounced as I'd like it to have been? No, uh, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to influence our future plans when we look back at drill selection, uh, the demands of the session, etc. So the locomotive demands, um, you look at two key principles, front load and taper, and then wherever you're going to increase the intensity generally, we probably decrease the volume. So the day before the game tends to be um, relatively low key with very short, sharp, intense blocks within it. That often doesn't register in um, presentations such as this or a graphic such as this that would, um, would give you any kind of spike. You should be looking to be as fresh as possible. So we've seen, just scrolling back slightly, a number of different data display platforms so far. Some of that will make absolute sense to people that are looking at it. A lot of that would make zero sense or understanding to a coach and coaching team. Simplistically put, they're not analysts, they're not statisticians, um, and they need to see, from my understanding of the coaches I've worked with, they need to see the key information very cleanly and very quickly. So the message now is cutting out the noise. So for all of that massive information and those different platforms that we've got, the platform I've now got here is the Click IT use of um, data display. Um, and I think you'll probably agree, looking at it, it gives you a very, very clear and concise visual. So this is any given training day. Um, you're more than welcome to screenshot it because there isn't real live data in there, not giving away trade secret, secrets. The Australians won't beat us off the back of reading this page, but it gives you an overview of where I felt the project could go to from a GPS point of view and the training load um, monitoring. So daily snapshot for the coach. What did he want to see and why did I formulate it this way? We looked at making sure we had the, the metrics indexed for the coach in a, in a ranked player order. So he wanted to know at his request, you know, who's gone the hardest, who's done the most, can you rank it for me? Absolutely coach, we can here. We've also got the lovely visuals of headshots, etc. We've got the four metrics displayed in distance, meters per minute, dynamic stress, and high speed running meters. So they are just a sample of some of the key metrics that we've used. What, and I apologize here, I've slightly moved my arrow up from the point that I wanted. If you look at the arrow that comes in here, and just scan your eyes into the left, we've actually got where the green box is, it says metric, and then you've got high speed running meters in the green box to the left there. That isn't a facility to hot swap. So although we've got four key metrics displayed, only two of those metrics are fixed based on coach um, demand. We wanted to know how far they'd run and how quickly they'd run there. Then we've got the ability to, from a sport science and performance point of view, get that snapshot of the training for the team 
on different metrics, whether they be locomotive or cardiovascular. And all of a sudden, we start to get far more useful information in, a, in, a, in clarity with a, with a clear format. All of this is formulated from the index at the side, as you can see on the left there, the quick filters. Uh, and it's literally as simple as click, click, click to select through players, positional groups, uh, certain segments of the session, etc. So dates or sessions, literally at the click of a button. I've given you the um, sweeps there before I wanted to flick over to it. That snapshot of information provides us with so much great. It tells you a full session and also one final point on it, it gives you averages for the squad in the circled area at the bottom right there. You can see the averages. So there are different ways of displaying that. You could throw a trend line through there, etc. Absolutely no issue on this, this particular format. But I prefer just to have that in numerically for the coach to see as a visual for immediate comparison. Take that a step further and actually within a training session, uh, within 60 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever you want to train for, there's a multitude of different drills and components within any sport at, at all over the world, not just rugby league. So the next step that we took was to actually break down all of the splits within the session. So as you can see on here, it starts to get a bit colourful and a bit noisy. But I've purposely thrown everything into this so you could see, see the full, full visual. Drill splits, so you can see the actual numbers of achieved by each, by each player within each component. See the averages on that. Also able to hop swap in and out, all the hypermetrics that are in that. And if you, if you so choose, you've got the ranked index to the right as well. Um, and just as a backup and a support from a practitioner's point of view, being able to say, well, coach, I can tell you that this, the demands of this were X and the demands of that were Y, or this should have been at game speed and this wasn't, et cetera, et cetera. All of the debates that coaches on the ground, sport scientists are having uh, the world over can be supported very simplistically with a very clean and concise format and visual. So our training load, and we're almost taking a step back now to take a step forward. How did we predict, and I mentioned that we predicted a model prior to training, and then post on we, we gathered the data together and were able to say with a clear overview, this is what actually happened, and fortunately married up. We had a number of different wellness components to assess. Neuro, neuromuscular status is absolutely key, so we used a sit and reach, grip squeeze, and a groin squeeze, so there were our three. We've seen a bit more about the data collection here. We had a subjective wellness questionnaire through the fusion system that focused on some key questions about upper and lower body soreness. Also asked about energy levels, sleep, all the traditional things that you'd see. Nothing really groundbreaking there, but the technology in which it was captured and displayed is what I think is important. Here. Maybe for those coaches that are in on the webinar here, Ask yourself how many times you actually capture data but do nothing with it, or how many times you actually capture data and the environment is so intense, so many demands on your time that you actually put it to one side and don't actually you don't actually get a chance to summarise, act, evaluate, look at trends within that data, etc. We've got here um, a number of different data entry methods all channeled in through one system. We also looked at biochemical, I mentioned that, uh, in creating kinase. So we're taking blood samples on a daily basis from the players. And we use the markers in CK, which is typically referenced for, it's really a, a very clear way of looking at muscle damage, to start to look at our player fingerprints and profiles of the soreness related to the subjective wellness scores. What we didn't do, and I would never claim at this point, was predict or dictate our training based from creating kinase. There are too many variables currently and not enough research to support it, but it's part of our journey towards a World Cup in 2017 and then beyond in 2021. We felt as a value added, this would be really useful for us to start profiling 
the core of our players, seeing how they responded to different recovery modalities, um, which is the title of the presentation, and then and then act accordingly, maybe individualizing our work a little bit more, our recovery work, rather than applying a one-size-fits-all blanket approach. Right? The key statement at the bottom there is that creatine kinase remaining elevated 120 hours post-match, <laughs> recommending required modifications for at least five days post-game. Well, in an implied world, we're almost playing again by that point. So um, when you take your scientist and purist hat off and take away some of the research and go, yes, I understand, I've read, I see, uh, how do I apply that? There's no coach in world sport. Actually, fellas, you go relax. I'll see you the day before the game next week. Don't worry about training. It just doesn't happen. So we're talking about working out what model and what training load through the metrics and the data that we've collected suit your athletes and your environment and make them best fit. In addition to the biochemical markers, if you see more of the data here, we gathered force plate data. We're looking at a long-term project within this, and I'm, not, I'm really not going to spend too long on, on this, um, at the eccentric um, duration for the guys with the vertical jump. It's very much a project that is in motion, and the exact use of the data is yet to be determined, but it gives you an insight into the number of different projects that we're running in terms of trying to get this readiness to play number, uh, this maybe one number, the holy grail, uh, into our program within the next billion years. So um, if you ask me, you know, if you're typing in a question to ask me at the end what had real value and what didn't, I'll probably answer that now. Force play analysis, it was lovely to have the environment we're in facilitated it, but if it was um, was it an absolute prerequisite to the program and the management of the athletes, my answer would be no. What we did find, uh, just to give you a quick overview in a, in a simplistic format, was that really five days post-game was the first time that players returned to baseline levels in terms of eccentric duration, and perhaps the elevation in that eccentric duration warranted interventions in the gym, from a strength-based point of view, in terms of loading in the gym rather than maybe field-based loading, that would inform our thinking on how we prepare the players in the weight room within this intense environment. So drawing back round again, we've got one step back, we're now striding on two or three steps that so we've got all this data, but you know, we've got multiple sources, we've got a number of laptops working, we've got people gathering, different members of the team gathering different elements of the data. How do we pull all that together? We're back to the click it format, which has worked very, very well for us. You'll see some similarities in the wellness dashboard here in terms of we've got four very simplistic bar graphs that give you the key metrics that we're working on. The reoccurring themes of fixed metrics being the wellness questionnaire, um, some nice little touches within it, baseline versus personal best, so we can see a bit of variance there without getting too technical. Um, and we also have the, the traffic light or the red, amber, green status based on ranges within the squad, um, very much in its infancy when we launched this project. Really pleased to be able to say we're now at a point where every player has their own individual rag status, so based off the um, delivery of numbers that they put in through the five-week program. So that's been something that when the players come back together with us in the autumn, as England players are grouped back together for a very similar model camping in about four months' time, three months' time, um, we will actually be able to look at the fingerprint of their profile far more accurately. Um, for players that don't have a fingerprint that might be new to the group, we also have devised uh, positional averages to allow us to categorize the players a little bit more accurately rather than the broad brush stroke that might be just a, a standard red amber green of that. Again, we've got the facility here to hot swap. So we've seen a massive information for a squad of 23 players into one side of A4. How many reports do you generate in the world of analytics that get onto one side of A4 and give you the amount of bang for buck that this might do? 
Does it give all the answers? No. Do you need to use your intuition? Do you need to know your athlete? Yes, and I keep reaffirming those. But the simplicity of the visual would mean that most people that you approach with that piece of paper would be able to interpret, make some interpretation of the information on there. Quite often within the analytics world and what I, the guys that I work with, getting too excited, getting too complicated, taking it too far, goes beyond the remit of the applied environment and coaches being able to understand and embrace. And the reaction I've seen from world leading coaches to that kind of um, avenue of pursuit is that they then turn away from it. So for all of us that like analytics and understand how to balance its application within professional sport or other business, it's not ramming the numbers down someone's throat. It's giving them what they need in an understandable format to make an impact and direct transfer on performance. The addition to the page that you've just seen is the, the index here. Um, again, red, amber, green status. And for those that maybe don't want to interpret bar graphs with, with their, a, a multitude of information on it, just simply being able to read raw data, raw numbers works very well. But what it doesn't do is give you anything that isn't vital within our, within our screening process. Um, and the going back to the what you need to know, what was nice to know, originally this started with far more information on it than currently is. We tried to whittle it down and as we move into 2017, it will actually be streamlined again to provide a more succinct overview. But it gives you that alternative information. And literally, at the click of a button, that is generated based off the information you saw on the slide previously. Great stuff. Cool. So, just turning back round slightly now to cardiovascular load, uh, I'm not going to stay too long on this. It gives you an idea here of the match that had the most significant cardiovascular load to the players. That also contributed, and the reason I dropped it in here, contributed to the recovery strategies that we're coming on to shortly and the whys and wherefores of that. So that locomotive cardiovascular load differed between test one, two, and three. We saw in test match one really looks very comfortable for players. Test match three significantly more difficult. Um, I'm going to ask everyone a question at this point is, you don't know that prior to the event. What should your training look like if the matches are getting progressively more difficult? Should training be getting progressively more demanding over the series? Or would you hope that actually the training load was done in the early stages of the tournament, as we've seen with the football tournament that's ongoing? I, I don't follow a massive amount of football, but I would imagine the training volume is absolutely zero and all of the demands and training adaptations, if that's what they're pursuing, or adaptations and maintenance come from the game and the game demands. So again, we looked at, uh, it just reaffirms the philosophy that we had, trying to front load our cardiovascular um, loading over the three days of training, making sure that we're make, getting the loading on day one, two, beg your pardon, take it back day three and two, and then one being relatively low in terms of intensity prior to the game. So bringing it round to more of a summary, and this is, um, just pleased to be able to put these couple of slides in um, since the tournament finished and since we reviewed the data as we, you've seen there, and since we formed some opinions on what, what we felt benefited the group and what didn't. And this is now just a sample and a very early sample of the way we're taking our, our program. Because we've looked at sessions on a daily basis, monitoring on a daily basis. We've made informed decisions from that. We also generally need a longitudinal visual of training intensity, training load, training volume, match demands, match load, etc. Uh, and the guys at Click have, have been very, very proactive in helping my um, very basic idea has become a reality in terms of now transmitting data from not only player by player to the squad, looking at averages within the squad, etc., 
and again allowing me to feed back to the coaching staff more clarity of the key trends we've seen. The data you can see in front actually is taken from a different group but it gives you an idea of um, methods in which it can be displayed, analyzed, interpreted and I, I've stuck with the same principles within that but uh, the key areas that we look at in terms of training load or the longitudinal training load of players and then uh, in reference to some of the, there's some far more experienced deliverers than, than myself out there currently talking about training stress balance and, and that really links into that philosophy of how do you know the stresses and strains of the players in a longitudinal view with clarity without getting lost in the multitude of metrics there are, a multitude of data sources that are, are available within within the team sport environment on a day-to-day -day basis and a week-to-week -week. and then competition to competition which in the context of England would be league is a five week period per annum. So very intense and very important that it's right as the ultimate outcome is is a win. Just some key summaries there, I'll just bring that back. So uh, again you've got a visual on the hot swaps, and you've got a visual on a standard deviation thrown in there and a mean figure running through. Another sample, another idea and another interpretation of the way the data could look, uh, everybody would do it differently, I'm sure if it was if it was your own project, you may have further ideas. Again, a testing index based on that GPS number. The one factor I wanted to highlight here, which I really feel is valuable, is being able to look at individual player or session data. Literally, the click of a button gives you that information. Dropping that information across from the Viper system, straight into the click, and literally easily accessible on that testing index and really, really informative in terms of being able to sit back and then plan and strategize based on the information that you've got in front of you. So going back to the title of the presentation today, Data Driven Athlete Recovery, all of our data drove the program to recover the athletes as best we possibly could. Really, this should be a part two to this presentation, which is another 25 slides giving you the detail on the interventions we've put in place. What I wasn't willing today to do today was give you the exact protocol per player uh, and probably be able to say this worked um, without doubt, beyond reason, without question, better than that method. But as a team and as a group and as a performance staff, we decided on a number of interventions to listed there um, and we offered the athlete a ownership on the interventions that they felt were most suitable for them. That in turn gave us more buy-in than we could ever have hoped for. Players felt they were doing things which were really valuable to them. They could then see their data, they could interpret their data uh, and believe me I love rugby league players but there's a number of them that wouldn't um, understand what 10 pounds minus 5 pounds is at times, but they could understand, bless them, the data that we provided for them. And there are a number of them that became like sponges and became athletes that wanted to embrace recovering in certain ways to try and improve the data and the statistics that we put in front of them. Without being completely blinkered by numbers, it became a really powerful tool for individuals within our group. And, and from a professional sports environment, you can't ask for more than that place in. Well, I will try X, Y, and Z and see what it does to my numbers. Is it conclusive? Is it absolutely um, definitive in what it's going to tell us? No. But if it gets players undertaking interventions which will help them in some way, even if it's a placebo effect, that has to get your athlete to the start line in a better better shape than it would have done otherwise would be my, my take on that. So you can see uh, all the interventions there. What were the outcomes then of driving the program in this way through data and through recovery? Well, we had 23 players fit at the start, we had 23 players fit at the end. As you saw, the intensity of the games increased and typical trends for one, two and three and the exhibited trends versus the predicted were actual 
were reality. The collision of the game created chaos, um, but all the interventions that we put in place helped to nullify the, the collision damage, if you like. A long and winding road of individualization and future planning. Did we have all the answers for every player at every, every time, every day and every stone that we unturned? No. Did more questions come up than answers? Probably it did. But what we did achieve was the noise issue. We had data that we felt was really useful and we had athletes and coaches embracing it. It wasn't the be all and end all of the program, but it supported our best practice. So um, if you, and then as you can see on the image to the right, ultimately the team was successful and there was a win outcome. A lot of this was made possible just to highlight here the people that we work with quite closely. It's by Click IT, uh, Stat Sports I alluded to, Fusion Sport in terms of data collection, uh, our training venue at St George's Park, and then the University of Chester in terms of analysing and supporting some of the work we've done with the, the data. Probably the key person in all this was Steve McNamara, the head coach of England um, for that period. And his vision and drive on the project gave um, gave every member of staff ownership and the ability to develop it at this point. You can see the players there are pretty pleased about winning as well. So that offset some of the um, some of the um, intensity around the numbers and information that they were given. My take homes and conclusions for all this is, um, and I hope you found the 43 and a half minutes. I'll get to 45 just. Um, is that you know are we chasing data in the world that we're living in are we actually making an impact so some key ones maybe from me to finish off the basics had to be right in the program before we got to marginal gains one percenters and the hollywood jazz that some of the hollywood that you've just seen this was built over five years if you've got baseline of x and you suddenly throw y z z a D, E at it, without the foundation, it will crumble around you um, and you'll lose people along the way. So get the basics right first. Basics can be the best thing. Does it have a direct impact on your athletes? If it doesn't and you're collecting data and your data analytics isn't driving impact on the athlete and the direct transfer to performance, then be man enough, be, be, the, be intuitive enough to say, nope, don't need it and then move on. Coach intuition is a big part of this. You can't just rely on the numbers, and we didn't, um, and, and use the people around you. Part of all of that is investigating, evaluating what you've done, which is hopefully I've demonstrated that England would believe currently doing. Weigh up the cost versus return, <laughs> very interesting one. You know, what does it cost to do something like this, and what is the return? Um, there are interventions, simplistic interventions with minimal cost that may be shown more return in, in different sports and different contexts of business across the world. So uh, in, a, in a sport that relies on funding, absolutely key. Going back to is there one magic number and a readiness to play, I don't think there ever will be one magic number. If you ever find that one magic number, please email me after this and let me know what that magic number is because we'll use it. Uh, when I find it, I promise I'll share it, but I don't think there is, and then it's working out which of the numbers mean something to you. And then, final one, uh, make the model that you work with fit your program, not the program fit the model. So if you've screenshotted every slide here today and you've got 25 shots, but this model, look at this, I, I think quite a lot of it, or equally you might go, this model throws a load of guff, etc. fine, I'm a Yorkshireman, I can take that, that's no problem. Um, make the model you use fit your program. You know, there may well be elements of other models that will work better for you uh, and use that intuition. Uh, and by all means, please don't think I'm, I'm teaching you to suck eggs at this point. So, the final one for me is to say thank you for listening. I hope hopefully everyone's still with us. Um, and to Click and to Derek for facilitating me having 45 minutes of listening to my own voice. Uh, there are some contact details on there. If you, if you do want to ask or make contact, and I'm going to hand back to Derek now for um, a few minutes. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. That was great. I mean, that's the second time I've heard it, and uh, 
I thought it was a good first time, even better second time. Well done. Uh, we've got a couple of questions through, so I'll just throw these in before we finally wrap up. Uh, the first one is, in developing this facility, how easily did it handle the multiple data sources that you mentioned? And how did you progress from those first draft ideas, probably on the back of a fat packet, <laughs> to what now looks like a highly functional tool? Yeah, um, I'll probably go to the second part of that question. The ideas for this originated from, wouldn't it be nice to, with an A4 sheet of paper, see the data like this? And being frustrated with the amount of different devices that we had and sources of data that we had that were spread around the business on different Excel documents, fancy dashboards, memory sticks, and no actual central location. So it was literally, right, can we get all this into one place? Who do we go to to get it? Um, and, and, you know, can it, can it be done? How easily is it drawn from multiple sources? Well, very, very easily once the, the links have been made, we literally channel everything in. It's literally a data drop to a file from, from the format that you're working with, and that sinks into the system, and that's, you know, the, the, the skill set of the guys at Click that have helped, um, and the appeal of the system to, to facilitate that, and then being able to then manipulate it from that point. So hopefully I'm just um, thinking back through the question. I've covered it there that you know, it's infancy, very broad strokes of ideas and, and rough, um, all channeled together, and then the ability to make ongoing um, changes to it as, as you see it develop in your mind, I think is key. Because I think if I presented that again in 18 months' time, it will look very different again. Not That's not demeaning or rubbish in what we've got there, but we will, as with everything, technology, things will advance as the mind advances and my grey matter goes slower than most, so. Okay, fair enough. And uh, just one more question, I guess this is a good way to finish as well, it's a good question. You've obviously invested a good deal of time in setting up this effectively bespoke solution for your needs. Has it been worth the effort and cost? Yeah, um, yeah, I use, you know, I'm a strength and conditioning coach originally by trade. I don't hide that. Um, you know, I love my profession. I'm very lucky to do the job that I do now. Um, front loading, front loading projects for me um, is key, and I felt that we were losing in all the, the pace of the environment, whether it's business or sport. You're working, you blink, and you're on the next day. You're on the next game. You're on the next session, um, and I just felt we we're getting lost with actually. What we, what we had, and the information we had in front of us. So to front load and the luxury of the the environment now with the competition structures it is with five weeks per year, which is minimal, to load up that effort and, in, and time into building the system meant that throughout the duration of the camp, literally, I use it again, click, 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 information. Absolutely, it's worth it. And in terms of centralizing from an organization's point of view our data, you know, I fly out to Australia tomorrow. If I, you know, drop dead in Australia and been run over by a kangaroo, that data, that platform is not going down with me with a kangaroo. It is there for everyone to see, everyone in the business to access, and it eradicates all of the issues of well, where is that gone? Where is that gone? So absolutely front loading, building um, the time and the cost into it long term in terms of man hours as well from a from a an actual physical cost point of view has been well worth it yes okay that was the right answer thank you <laughs> great okay well look thanks for those questions we appreciate that and also thanks once again for giving up your time to attend today uh, hopefully it's been time well spent and certainly at click it we've been delighted to support richard as i mentioned earlier in what we think is a really innovative use of visual interactive analytics in this particular field. And that's maybe one thing that didn't come across in the presentation today. All of those screens that are relating to the um, analysis that Richard showed are actually interactive. You can interact and ask your own questions of the, of the data to provide the information that you need. And in fact, we're doing similar things with other partners, including England Athletics, Irish Rugby Union, and Chelsea Football Club, just to mention a few. Uh, anyway, hopefully you've seen what a significant impact, you know, the combination of approach 
and technology can, can make in this particular field. Um, our contact details are on the screen there, as Richard mentioned. And if you'd like to contact either Richard or myself um, about you know, what Richard's doing or how the Click Analytics platform can maybe help you, we'd be delighted to hear from you. So that's it, folks. Uh, thanks again, and we'll now close the webinar. Thank you.